How were the plates translated? Okay, Joseph Smith now has these heavy plates at home, and now he's going to translate them into English. That's necessary because the plates are not written in English. That would make sense. But what were they written in? They were written in a language called Reformed Egyptian. What is Reformed Egyptian? Have no idea. <laughs> There's no such language. And uh, you ask any qualified Egyptologist about Reformed Egyptian, they'll probably look at you cross-eyed because it really it's only in the imagination of Joseph Smith. Anyway, according to Joseph Smith's story, in Joseph Smith's history, one, uh, section 1, verse 35, it says that also that there were two stones in silver bows, and these stones fastened to a breastplate constituted what is called the Urim and Thummim, deposited with the plates. Now, I want you to imagine in your mind's eye what's going on here. He's, he's, gotten, he's dug up these plates. He's gone to the place where the angel told him to go. He's, he's digging down. He finds these, these plates, and buried with them are, is what he calls the Urim and Thummim. They are stones fastened to a breastplate. And it says, And the possession and use of these stones were what constituted seers in ancient or former times, and that God had prepared them for the purpose of translating the book. The purpose of these stones being buried with the plates was so that Joseph Smith could translate the Reformed Egyptian into the English language by looking through these stones. I want you to notice the picture here, taken from the Ensign Magazine, February 2001. Notice what Joseph Smith is doing. He's leaning over the gold plates. He has his hand, his right hand, on top of the plates as if he's running his finger across the lines, and he's supposedly reading off the Reformed Egyptian to his scribe, who, of course, you do not see in this picture. Do you see the Urim and Thummim fastened to his face at all? No. You never will. I have never, in all my 30 plus years of studying this religion, I have never seen uh, a picture put out by the Mormon church where it shows Joseph Smith looking through these spectacles, translating the Book of Mormon. It's always like this, which is not historically accurate if we're going to believe what Joseph Smith said. Here is a case of where the Mormon church has to revise its own history in order to make it even somewhat believable. But that's not the way Joseph Smith said it happened. It's not the way his scribes said it happened. In fact, it didn't even happen at all like this, and this might surprise you. How did Joseph Smith translate the Reformed Egyptian into English into our modern edition of the Book of Mormon? Well, this is what David Whitmer said. David Whitmer's name is found in every edition of the Book of Mormon. He is one of the three witnesses to the authenticity of the book. And David Whitmer tells us how Joseph Smith performed this feat. He said, according to an address to all believers in Christ, that Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. Now, first of all, what in the world is a seer stone? Anybody here know what a seer stone is besides Randy Carroll and Aaron and Anyone, anybody else know? You don't know what a seer stone is, okay? Well, here's what a seer stone is. According to B.H. Roberts, Brigham H. Roberts, who was a church 70 and also a church historian in the early years, around the uh, late 19th, early 20th century, B.H. Roberts said in his Comprehensive History of the Church, volume 1, page 29, that the seer stone was a chocolate-colored, a brown-colored, somewhat egg-shaped stone which the prophet found while digging a well in company with his brother Hiram. That's what he's using. And here's how it happens, according to David Whitmer. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat. He puts this chocolate colored, co I always want to say covered, and it's colored, it's not covered. Chocolate colored egg-shaped stone into a hat. He draws the hat closely around his face to exclude the light, and in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. One character at a time would appear, and under it was the interpretation in English. Brother Joseph would read off the English to Oliver Cowdery, who was his principal scribe, and that's true. There were other scribes, but Oliver Cowdery was the principal scribe. He's actually related to Joseph Smith. He was a cousin. And when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, 
then it would disappear and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God and not by any power of man. Now let's go back and review this because this is very important. Joseph Smith would put the seer stone into a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. How big were those gold plates again? Six by what? What were the measurements? You've got your notes there? Six by eight by six. Can plates six by eight by six fit in a normal hat? No, they're not in the hat. Smith's not looking at the plates. He's looking at a rock. He's looking at a rock. He's not looking at the plates. This is really crucial. Why did he need to dig them out of the ground if he's not even looking at them when he's doing this so-called translation? He's looking at a magic rock, folks. Is any flags going up here? He's looking at a magic rock that he found while digging a well with his brother Hiram. He puts a rock in a hat, and he holds the hat up to his face. First of all, there's no way he could hold it up to his face with those plates in it, that's for sure, okay? But he's looking at this rock. Now, there's a, a Mormon historian who I was listening to at a Sunstone conference several years ago. And there were two historians. And they firmly believed this story. And they were telling about how Joseph Smith translated the plates. And so they got through with this elaborate description, very similar to what I just read you. And when they opened up for Q&A, I was sitting in the back, I raised my hand, and they called on me, and a uh, gentleman called on me, I says, I, I have a question. I says, you, you talk about Joseph Smith putting the stone in the hat. How deep was that hat? And they looked at me kind of funny, and there was this like, nervous chuckle in the crowd. I said, no, I'm serious, how deep was the hat? Because most pictures of hats back in those days, they were not very deep. I said, the reason I'm asking this is because if Joseph Smith had an egg-shaped stone, let's assume just you know, conservatively, that the stone was probably a, an inch and a half thick. You put that in a hat that's about, let's say, three, four and a half inches deep. You've got something this far away from your eyes. How could Smith focus on something that close to his eyes? And remember, the story goes that he was doing this for like hours at a time, reading off the translation, you know, and then they would go on to the next set of characters. Well, one of these historians gave a very interesting answer. He said, well, you have to understand that Joseph Smith was not looking at the stone. He was looking through the stone. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but I, I've learned this since. That that's a, uh, and, and I could be wrong on this. I'm getting this from another person who claimed to know about this. But that's called scrying, where you kind of look through things and you see things mysteriously. It, it's really folk magic, folks. That's what this is. It's folk magic. And uh, some would say that's occultism. That might be a little bit of a stretch the way the word occult is understood in our culture today, but it certainly is folk magic. And that's not surprising because Joseph Smith was very immersed in folk magic, and so was his family. There's no doubt about that. And even honest Mormon historians will admit to this. This is the kind of character that we are dealing with here. But another point that I want to bring out, when we look at David Whitmer's explanation of how it was translated, where he says, and when it was written down and repeated to Brother Joseph to see if it was correct, then it would disappear and another character with the interpretation would appear. Thus the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God and not by any power of man. If that's really how it happened, why do we have so many editions of the Book of Mormon with corrections made to it? There's no margin for error if that's really how it happened. Remember, it would not go on to the next set of characters until it was read back correctly. So why does the Mormon church feel it necessary to make corrections to this book that was supposedly translated by the gift and power of God? Yes. Is there a original handwritten translation there is, a, there is a handwritten... Um, printer's copy, from what I understand, that was given to the printer, Grandin, in Palmyra, New York. And you can see also by looking at this handwritten account that changes have been made to the handwritten account. Some of them actually are carroted above the line and written in another person's handwriting. So someone's been doctoring these things up. So there's, there's some real problems. Like I say, only in a court in California would this ever get past people, you know. <laughs> 